Um, so, yeah, and Joshua, they were supposed to drive all the enemies out. God gave um, the people of Canaan 400 years to repent. And then they got an extra 40 years because they were disobedient. But when they came into the land, they were to wipe them out. God had, their, their cup of iniquity was full. And it was time. But, yes, ma'am. Yes. If you count the generations, Obed's eleven. I think it was eleven. So, and the, and they, there's a di difference of opinion as to is that hyperbole, is that or is that exactly from? Um, it would be eleven from, I guess, when it happened, when the Moabites rejected. That's uh, that's what I would think, but yes, ma'am. Okay, is it is it now? Is it okay? Is it because it's under my shirt? Um, I right here. Should I move it? Oh. You think I'm loud enough. My kids thought I was loud enough. <laughs> My husband probably thinks I'm loud enough. Is that better? Are you getting it? Okay. All right. All right, turn, turn, turn. Get this thing. I didn't have a pocket today. It has to be on my waistband here. All right. Is that better? Okay. All right. What book are we in? After all this, I don't know what we're doing. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're talking about who is a Moabite. And she, where does she end up? Pardon me? In Judah. And who does she worship? God. And so, and whose genealogy does she end up in? Jesus's, you know, um, so, and nobody's beyond God's reach. Nobody's beyond God's reach. And, and he brought her in. Um, Naomi and Ruth were depending on a, a, a relative. Can you tell me a little bit about what that was about? Because we look at it a little bit more this morning. What was it? What do you call him? A kinsman redeemer. The G-O-E-L or the G-A-A-L. The Goel. All right. And what was he supposed to do? Okay, he can redeem the land. He has a couple other career opportunities. <laughs> okay, that was, yep, the Levite marriage. What else? He's a blood adventure. We're going to look at that in uh, lesson three. I looked at it this week by an oops, slips. <laughs> I, I don't know why I went off in cities of refuge, and I'm preparing a lesson. I'm like, we didn't talk about the cities of refuge. I'm like, why did I study the cities of refuge? <laughs> All right. Uh, so the blood avenger, uh, he redeems the land. And then there's one more thing. He redeems the slave. Okay. Okay. And so <clears throat> they were dependent on a kinsman. And did he obey God and do his job? Yeah, he did. He did. And so um, the reason that he and Ruth are in, in the lineage of Christ is because of his obedience and his willingness to step in and uh, be the Goel, redeem the land, and redeem Ruth. And Ruth had to be obedient because we don't know how old Boaz was, but we've kind of talked about that. He might have been 80. Oh, yeah, <laughs> who said that? Woo, Yeah. This, yes, they, what God, because God has a heart for widows and orphans. And he, no other land, no other people had such a provision for widows. And this week, so we're going to look a little bit more at, at, at the importance of why it was so important for that land to be redeemed. So when you look, did your lesson, where 
did it, it, it led you to, to uh, Genesis 48, the first time the word redemption is used in scripture. And Genesis 48, and it was um, Jacob is blessing Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manassas. And in uh, 48, 15, he, he, it says, and he, Jacob, or Israel, blessed Joseph and said, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God before who, who has been my shepherd all my life to this very day. So he recognizes that from, from the time he was born, God was working in his life, including when he goes to Haran, when he, he and um, his brother-in-law were... <coughs> um, what was it? I'm having a brain fade. Um, Oh gosh, Jacob, huh? Laban. Laban, yes, thank you. Laban tricks him and then he comes back. He wrestles with the angel of the Lord. Um, so he recognizes that uh, God has been his shepherd. And then he says, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil. When do you think that was? When did he wrestle with an angel? Yeah, yeah, I think that was probably where, where he really, he, he put his hip out of socket and humbled, he humbled and he says, bless me. Don't leave me unless you bless me. And the messenger who it was pre-incarnate Christ said, well, what's your name? Because that, he started out faking his name. So here he is, it's what's your name? And he, he tells him his name. So that's the first time that we see the word redeem, redeem. We don't see it again until Exodus 6. And so we looked in Exodus 6 this week. And so let's take a look at the, the passage. And we're gonna, we have time to, to read it. It's 6, 1 through 8. I'm going to read it. it. would be page 15 is where you took your notes, and page 35 um, is where the um, scriptures are printed out, and it says, then, Mo then the Lord said to Moses, now you're going to see what I will do to Pharaoh. Under compulsion, he will let them go, and under compulsion, he will drive them out of his land. In other words, he is under going to be under compulsion. God spoke further to Moses and said, I am the Lord. I'm Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob as God Almighty, as El Shaddai. But, I, but by my name, Yahweh, Lord, I didn't make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them. You might jot down Genesis 15. That's where God established the covenant with Abraham. That's the covenant he's referring to, not Mount Sinai. Not the conditional covenant, if you'll obey me, I'm going to bless you. If you disobey me, I'm going to curse you. Here are my laws, all right? This is the one where God himself passed between the pieces and cut the covenant. And it was, it's totally and completely dependent on God. That covenant, a smoking oven and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. And God promised covenanted with Abraham and there are three important things one he promised descendants many descendants and we see by this time there are many descendants two he promised the seed Galatians 3 16 identifies that seed as Jesus Christ the seed that's going to come and bless everybody and then three he promised the land the land of Canaan, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it's, an ever, it's for an everlasting possession, and it's a covenant that depends on God, not on their obedience. And what do you know about God? <laughs> Pardon me? Say it again. What he says he does. Yeah, so let's put that. If God makes a promise, is he going to keep it? 
Okay, he's a he's a covenant keeping God. Yes. And descendants. Did I miss something? No, I was like trying to Yeah, those are the three The land, the seed, and the descendants. The descendants as the stars in the heaven and as the sand of the sea. Because at that time, how many children did Abraham have? Zero. And he was at least in his 70s. Not the prime time for having kids. All right. That's the covenant that he says that uh, he's going to establish with them Israel to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourn. Now, one other thing is when God, it, maybe let's just flip over to Genesis 15 because there's something else that he tells Abraham that's going to happen. <coughs> All right. 15, Genesis 15. Yeah, he said, yes, but yeah, verse 13, thank you. He said, God said to Abram, now, he wasn't Abraham yet. He's Abram. He says, no, for certain, your descendants will be strangers in a land that's not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. This is where they are. Okay. God warned, told Abraham that he'd go um, to the grave, but his descendants, How'd they end up in Egypt? Anybody remember? Fam another famine. But who was in charge in Egypt? Joseph. And so the whole tribe of, I of Israel comes down to Egypt because God had to save the seed. We think it's all about Joseph getting promoted. and No, he had to save the seed because God's a covenant-keeping God. And he promised... Messiah to come. All the other benefits, but the whole point is he's got to save the seed. And so now they're in Egypt, and they're going to be there for those 400 years. Starts out good, goes down. Okay, so this is where they are. This is what God is talking about to Moses. He says, I've heard the groaning of Israel because, of the, Egypt because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage, slavery, and I've remembered my covenant. It's not like God forgot, okay, because God can't forget anything. But he, he, it's coming forward. Again, he, he, and he says, um, tell or say to the sons of Israel, I am Yahweh, I'm the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from their bondage, and I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm with great judgments. I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I'll bring you to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you for a profit. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Possession. I am the Lord. So here in Exodus, what's gonna who who's gonna do something? Who? God. He's the one who's gonna do it. To whom? There we go. Yeah, he's gonna, it's to Israel. And they're a very worthy group, right? Okay. Now, they're big sinners just like the rest of us. And what's he going to do? What's he say he's going to do? He's going to redeem them. From the context, what does redeem mean? To, yeah, he's going to buy them out of the... What, what were they? Okay. They're, he's going to get them out of the slavery. And how's he going to do it? 
He's going to judge. What exactly does he say? An outstretched arm. Great judgments. So here we go. We've got the really the first, the big touchstone of Israel is God. The first thing that they really get involved with God on is that he's redeeming them. Um, and God brings them out of the house of bondage. All right. Now, let's see. I got to see my. All right. All right, let's look at Exodus 12. So now we've looked at 6, and so the, he tells he, Moses is going to do Exodus 12. We looked at Exodus 12, and 1 through 14. And God is ex explaining to Moses to explain to them what is going to happen. So let's start at the beginning. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, where are they? They're still in Egypt, all right? They're in Egypt, so nothing, none of this has happened yet. All right. When is this going to happen? When is this going to happen? Yeah, the first month, this is first month of the year. This is going to be their first month of the year. This is the, um, their, uh, what do you call it? Their spiritual calendar. First, and, and we know it as Nissan, not the car. Um, and it's March, April. It's spring. Okay, it's March, sometime, March, April, the month of Nissan. All right, and he tells them on the tenth of the month, what are they to do? Get a what kind of lamb? Unblemished. An unblemished, an unblemished, one year old, one year male. And what what are they to do with it? They keep it, yeah. They're going to keep it with them inside. They're going to protect it because they don't want it to get blemished. And so they're going to keep it till the 14th. So about three days, they're going to keep that lamb with them. You know, if you had kids, they're going to be getting attached to Fluffy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. How long um, did Jesus mem uh, minister? Three years. How long are they keeping this lamb? Three. Yeah, I just thought that was interesting. So they keep him in there for three days. They can look at him, make sure that he is unblemished. And then what do they do? At twilight. Uh-huh. Yep, they kill it. Then what happens? You're going to put blood on the doorpost. Some, some think twilight was like the time Jesus, you know, Jesus died on the cross from like three to five. <coughs> I, say that twilight could have been around that I was, I thought he died around three in the afternoon. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, yeah. it's just a dictionary I, I, that said twilight could also be. Uh, yeah. Okay. Did Jesus, I mean, the yeah. lamb could have died at three. It, okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's before it gets too dark. How's that? All right. So they put the, the blood on the lintel and the doorposts. And why did they do that? Good. God told them to. <laughs> Faith takes God at his word, right? There's nothing, I mean, in the big scheme of things, 
Is that going to ward off anything? Only spiritually. Faith takes God at his word. And so by doing that, what is God going to do? Yeah, who's the one that's, what's it say in this passage? Who's the one that's going to uh, strike down the firstborn? No, where's that death angel? Who's it say? God is going to strike down. I don't know where that death angel is, but it's not here. God will strike down. Yes, ma'am. Well, if, if you're, okay, if, if you've got him on. Uh, I'm good. I just, it wasn't a reference in here. No, just, no, I'm just calculating. Okay, all right, that's fine. I'm just calculating. Fine, sometimes I'll put the verse, okay. No, I'm just calculating. Sorry, that, that, no, 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 no. What train? It left the station. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just guessing, you know, any part of a, you know, the 10th would be all day, the 10th, the 11th, the 12th, and he's executed yeah. on the 13th. All right. Um, okay, God's going to strike down the firstborn. I don't know where that death angel is. I think he's with Charlton in the Ten Commandments because I really I didn't see it. Okay. All right. So God's the one who's going to execute judgment here. What else are they supposed to do? Okay, how you cook that lamb? Okay, if you look up in the uh, Zondervan Dictionary, it's going to say boil. And I just tell you that because if you ever have to do a devotional or you have to do something, don't rely on man's books, right? Stick with what the Bible says. Don't, you know, there's, you know you're in a hurry. Go back and read the passage. Because here's, here's a perfectly good example. I'm sure they didn't do it on purpose. They picked up something wrong. But it's not, eat, they're going to eat the lamb and they have to roast it. Roasting would be faster than boiling anyway. And probably tastes much better. Right? Okay. Yeah. Everything they missed when they got into the desert, right? And wanted to go back to slavery. All right. So they're going to eat this lamb. They can't leave anything left over. What else are they going to do? Okay, they got to have their sandals on. And what else do they have? Their loins girded. And their staff in hand. Now, I will tell you, normally they would never eat with sandals on. In fact, the sandals wouldn't be in the house. Holding your staff, that's something you're going to use out in the field. And I guess your loins girded. I don't know. But they're, what is this telling them? Be ready. be ready. Okay. Again, they're taking God at their word. They're, they're to be ready. So in obedience, they're doing this. Now... The blood is going to be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, God says, I'm going to pass over and no plague's going to strike you. Now, this, he says, is going to be a one-time event. No, what's it going to be? A memorial. Is it a memorial? We just, yeah, the Jewish people just celebrate, do... A lot of people in the world know about the Exodus and Passover. Yeah, yeah. Of course not. No, I know I've made a life, but if somebody was married and they were Israelites and they were Jews and they, the husband dies, does the the family still take care of that lady? Maybe not to the same extent, but still have that obligation. Like, you know, here, uh, Boaz, you know, took on. Uh -huh. Like, uh -huh. maybe, but do they still have some of that in place where 
the widow gets taken care of by the other members? Mean today? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah. I'm just curious. I think, they yeah. Still sort of. Sort of, yeah, do that. Yeah. So now this, this is done every year as a memorial throughout their generations. It's a permanent ordinance. And um, what happened to the firstborn if you didn't do this? Okay. Um, the firstborn male. Um, I dialogued with Pastor Jerry because we always wonder, is it all first, you know, because it's kind of, it does, it's firstborn male. And it's the same here as we're going. So once a year, Think about God is the great evangelist. Once a year, he wants to remind them who rescued and redeemed them. I did. No, I'm pretending. Uh, and who, who then owns you? God, yeah. He says, you're going to be my people, and I'm going to be your God. All right? But once a year isn't enough, is it? Because look at Exodus 13, 11 through 16. So once a year in the spring, it's a memorial. They've been doing it for centuries. But God knows us. He knows we're frail. We know he knows we forget. So here's once a year. But in Exodus 13, 11 through 16, he lays out another ordinance or perpetual thing. He says, now, when the Lord brings you to the land. So when is this going to happen? What's the time frame? Is it at the time he's, re he's telling them about it? No. Will it be in the wilderness? No. It's going to be when you get in the land. Okay, you got to get in the land. He's got, we've got, okay, what's he say? Okay, when you get in the land, you shall devote to the Lord, what? The first offspring. So, first offspring of what? Of man and beast. Can you imagine how many times you're going to do this? Think about it. Think about how every time, you know, when you're first married, your first offspring that opens the womb, if he's male, they're going to dedicate him. Beasts, you, sheep, goats, donkeys, I don't know, camels, all of that. Why? Why, why does he have you do this? To remind her. Oh, he's, God is so, he's such an evangelist. It's a reminder. Reminder of what? Pardon me? Okay, that he's, he owns it all. Yep. He says, I own it all. I own you. Why? Because I redeemed you. You're mine. And the whole idea of the firstborn would remind them of their deliverance from Egypt. Yeah. That he brought them out of the brought them out of the house of bondage. And he set them free. So God, from the very beginning, he wants them to know that he's a redeemer God. Well, let's put that over here. He's a covenant-keeping God. He's also a redeeming God. He's the God who owns it all. He's the God who owns you. 
Does he own you? Yeah, you've been bought with a price. Israel was bought with a price. <coughs> That's right. He, yeah, he's, yeah, he's the only one. He doesn't have to make a covenant. He just says it. He keeps his word. 100% of the time. Okay. Just shout, you know, don't don't hide it if you think about something about God you want to re remember. Okay. <coughs> so we've got God. We've got the Passover. I should say Passover. We call it the Passover. And then we've got redemption of the firstborn. Every time you do this, you know, why, Daddy, are we doing this? Why, Mom, do we do this? Teaching opportunity. This is why, because God is our Redeemer, because he rescued us from Egypt. He is, um, and we are, uh, belong to him. He owns all of it. We are bought with a price. He is our God, and we are his people. And they would do it over and over again. He is trying to get them mentally ready for the big redeemer, the Messiah redeemer that we're going to be looking at next week. Yeah. Okay. Good. Where did oh, the donkey? Uh, well, he says to redeem. Did he? Does he say it's because of his stubbornness? No. Oh, the commentary. Well, no, this is what. Okay, you want to go on a tiny rabbit trail? Okay. Sure. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, the donkey. Okay, so is the donkey a clean or unclean animal? He's unclean. All right. So it's an unclean animal, but he needs to be redeemed too. So there's a couple ways to do it. One is you sacrifice a lamb that isn't one, a male that opened the womb because you have to sacrifice it anyway. You could redeem it with money. Or you break its neck. Why? Because it belongs to God, and that means you don't get to use it. Do you remember in Jericho, all the treasure, all the people, all the animals were dedicated to who? Mm -hmm. To God. They were all his. But Achan didn't listen, and that created trouble. But <coughs> the firstborn belongs to God. Now... Humans, all right, a human, you, you, you can't break his neck. That would be murder, right? So if you look in Numbers 18, I think it's 16, there is, a, it says that five shekels of silver, you bring to the temple to buy Redeem that firstborn. Now, isn't it interesting that God put the two that you, you don't sacrifice next to each other, and he picks a donkey and a human? Did you, I mean, it's kind of ironic, isn't it? Well, if you go, so if you go and look at, turn with me in Job. Because God doesn't, you know, every word <laughs> in the scripture is purposeful, right? And, and it, it, there's no mistakes. Let me see here. Got to get to Job. Um, and, let's see. Job, um, let me look here. I think it's Job 6. 
7 11 7 11 or 11 7 uh, when I looked at it let's see I'll start with 11 7 let's see uh, it's the beast uh, let's look at 7 11 let's see all right I know what I want mm -hmm. well okay I gotta find just bear with me I gotta find my note because I thought it was it was interesting here um job 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 11 7 yeah okay 11 7 okay <clears throat> he says can you discover the depths of God answer no he's incomprehensible can you discover the limits of the Almighty? No. They are as high as the heavens. What can you do? Deeper than shield. Shield, what can you know? Its measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. If he passes by or shuts up or calls an assembly, who can restrain him? For he knows false men. He sees iniquity without investigating. And an idiot will become intelligent when the foal of a wild donkey is born, a man. So, oh, what, what's, what's a man compared to? A wild donkey. Now, how was Ishmael described? A wild donkey of a man. I don't think that was, I think there's a subtle thing here. <laughs> Maybe. That, there's no mistake. We redeem donkeys, we redeem men. Men are unclean, donkeys are unclean. Donkeys are no to, known to be difficult. Yeah. Men, difficult. Did you have some? Yeah. Well, it's going to affect the female um, if it's uh, when she has the baby. The, it's, the, the male is the, is the leader of the family. The male is the protector of the family. The male is the priest of the family, the head of the family. So in God's economy and the economy back then, the focus was, was on a male. You wanted to have a male child. You passed the land on to the, to the male. I know it doesn't sound fair. It's not like our culture, but that's the way it was. And our Messiah, our priest, is male. Yeah. It's not a commentary on whether your women are better or, or not. It's just, it is. Hmm. Different roles. Yeah. And that's, that's who, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I, you know, I just, I, I, you know, it's so, you know, that's why I double checked with Jerry on whether it was the male, only the male to be redeemed. And it, it, it's because it's a picture. It's, it's, a, it's a picture and it's, it's pointing to the importance of the firstborn. And who is the firstborn over all creation? Jesus, who's the firstborn from the dead? Jesus, not in order but in rank. Yes. I lost where we were in. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Job. We were in Job. Oh, then I said Ishmael. Ish uh -huh. We were. <laughs> it takes a village. Done it. Okay. It takes a village today. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. No. No, no, the firstborn, no, the girl's only firstborn male that opens the womb. Yeah, yeah. I double checked that because, you know, there's that party, I'm like, well, I want to be special too. But <laughs> that's not the picture. So if you had all girls, then No, but we did look at the inheritance if you had all girls. So, and we're going to get there. Okay. Okay. Yes. 
he would be, yeah, he would be the one, the firstborn male. But he, he's not the opener of the womb. But he would be the inheritor. Yeah. I, I, I think it's only the one that opened the womb. I'm not, I, you know, I don't know. It doesn't say. I'll work on it. I'll see if we can find that out. But, you know, I think it, we just let it say what it says. The firstborn male was the one that opens the womb. That's the one that's dedicated. In Egypt, yeah, it would have been the firstborn male. Losing a girl to the Egyptians, eh. Losing their firstborn son, tragedy. And it was in every household. Every household basically was affected in some way, shape, or form. And then that's Pharaoh. Pardon me? Then that's Pharaoh. Yes, yeah, yeah. The next Pharaoh would have been. Yeah, yeah. So he would have died. The next Pharaoh would have died. That's why. Yeah, well, I don't want to go there because I'll never get off it. But <laughs> we, after class, if you want to talk about Egyptian timeline. Um, and um, that, 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 anyway, okay, I don't want to go there because I can't, you know, it's something I learned. I can't, I can't explain it like I would want to. Okay, so just my idea was, you know, we're donkeys. That's okay. <laughs> he, you know, we're also sheep. Sheep are stubborn too. So, all right. So God has... He, he is pointing out the fact he's the redeemer. He wants them to remember, remember, remember. He redeemed them. They belong to him. If they belong to him, they're supposed to obey, right? All right. Hopefully. But they didn't. So let's look now at Leviticus 25. All right. Now this... Are you confused? No, just where everything I know. It's, that's one of the hard things about um, uh, topical studies. You're hopping all over the place. But go, that would have been page 17 where you took your notes, and page 57 would be your observation worksheet. Well, there's two of them. There's two of them, Levitic, two, of, two Leviticus 25s. Okay, are we together? There's two Leviticus 25s. Which one are we doing? Yeah, the, the uh, where's, I'm having trouble. One through 28, we'll start there. Makes sense. Okay, so where is this happening? Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai. All right, Leviticus is a one-month book. It, it all happens at Mount Sinai within a month, all right? Okay. And it's one month, all right? All right. Now, Moses is instructed. He says, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when you come to the land. So when is this going to happen? All right. Do you beginning to see? When, so they're setting apart. We're consecrating the firstborn. You have to be redeemed before you can consecrate. What did we learn in Romans? We looked at from 1 all the way to the end of 11. And we looked at all God did and how you are redeemed. How you are out of, move out of the darkness into the light. Then he calls us to, 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 to put yourself all on the altar. To consecrate yourself. You can't con consecrate yourself before you're redeemed. Right. So he says, when you get to the land, here's the first here's here's the first thing I want you to know. Now they're primarily this would be agricultural, so for six years you're gonna plant, you're gonna sow, you're gonna reap, you're gonna harvest. All right. What happens on the seventh year? 
Yes, it's a Sabbath rest for the land. And what Trudy said, it's fallow. You don't do anything to it. You let it. Now, I'm not a gardener, but I understand this is good. Good not to till it. Not Okay. <clears throat> can they eat from it? Yeah, they can eat from it. Who else? Can, so if it's their land, they can eat from it. Who else gets to eat from it? Servants. Yeah, animals, poor, mm -hmm. poor, foreigners. Okay. No other, no other um, group of people would have done this. What does it take to, to say, okay, this year we're not going to work in the field? A lot of faith. All right, it's going to take faith to do this. What do they have to have faith in? God's provision. It, does he know they're doing it? Yes. Will he provide? Yeah. Because he says, I'll provide enough for two years. I'll make sure that you have enough. Trust me. Yeah, Holly. <laughs> Sir. Mm-hmm. It would just come up. Yeah, the volunteers is what I call it at my house. Sometimes I have volunteers. I kill most things. But there's some things that volunteer to come back next year. So this would be all the volunteer grain and grapes and fruit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right. But they're not cultivating it, pruning it. Any, and everybody can come pick food. Okay. Now, what happens to all that time they're going to have? My goodness. You, I, I, don't, I know Marilyn has a garden and works super hard. I mean, spends hours out there. You have a garden too, don't you? Okay. If you're not gardening, what do you have? Lots of time. What's the idea? They're supposed to be getting with the Levites and learning about God and resting. There was no um, group in that land that took a day off. Everybody worked seven days a week. They thought Israel was really weird. But what does God know about us? About man. Well, we do need to be busy, but we need rest. How many people get enough sleep? I mean, really? Yeah, no. No, he knows that we need rest. And he knows that we need to be put in situations where we're going to trust him. Could you imagine? God said, okay, your husband or you can't work for a year. And you're just going to have to trust me for all your provision. A lot of, uh huh, yeah. Well, wasn't that that story you found? Or one of those missionary, one of those tribes? Yeah, that. They prayed for mm -hmm, everything, mm -hmm. for orphans, and, and it would appear. I mean, it would God, so God does provide. But do we really give Him the chance? No. Well, and then. I'm already working it out in my brain. Your brain yeah, how, yeah, I'm like, oh man, what if my husband wasn't. Uh, yeah, it took a lot of faith. But they took God at his word. Yeah, Trudy. I've had this thing of getting real anxious about mm -hmm. if, if I'm supposed to be somewhere, I'm late. If somebody's coming, I'm not really. If it, this and this and this and this. So, you know, I, I kind of get worked up. Yeah. Well, one day, I heard in my head, there will be time. Mm -hmm. And I just always remember that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't me. Yeah. <laughs> what are you supposed to do first? Seek first the kingdom. Yeah. And his righteousness, and then everything else. But it's really to be true. Mm -hmm. And it's a comfort. It is a comfort if you give God the chance. Mm -hmm. Give him the chance. But not only did he say, okay, every seven years, Sabbath rests for the land. 
you get a rest. I, I'd be looking forward to every seven years, yeah. man. I mean, I mean, don't you like, it's like a snow day for a year where you, you can't go to work and you can't, yeah, I mean, we really, we do need those days. Well, now on top of that, he says, okay, here's uh, you, Sabbath rest. So every seven years, uh, seven years for, for seven seasons, that's 49 of those when you rest. But when you get to the 50th year, now he says, I'm going to ask you to celebrate a jubilee year. Now, now that they're not trusting God for one growing season, they're actually trusting him for three. What kind of faith would that take? A lot of faith. So in the Jubilee year, he says, the land lays fallow again. But not only that, what happens? Some really incredible stuff happens. No other nation had anything like this. Okay, the land, any land goes back to, yeah, it goes back to the owner. It goes, yeah, the uh, original owner or if the, uh, you know, situations, tribe. The land always had to stay in the tribe. They couldn't permanently sell the land. Why? It's God's land. See, no permanent sale. So when they would sell it, the selling price was based on how productive the land was and how many years they could hold it. Okay? <clears throat> That's fair. What else happened? So the land is going back to who had it first. That kept, that kept people from getting uber rich or uber poor. It kind of brought everybody back together. But what else? What else happens? Okay, if you sold yourself into slavery, you're set free. You and your sons, you're, if you sold yourself into slavery, you get to, you're set free. In Deuteronomy, which we didn't look at, it also says that all the debts debts, personal debts are forgiven. So if you owed me money, too bad, so sad for me. Because all the debts are forgiven in the Jubilee year. That'd be a great year. If somebody paid a debt mm -hmm. and like say early in it, and <laughs> he died before the Jubilee year. Mm -hmm. I guess it's forgiven. I don't know. It didn't. It didn't. Uh, I mean, any any debts that are outstanding in the year jubilee are forgiven. Yes, ma'am. Well, you're you're not. Are you Jewish? No. So you wouldn't be doing this. Oh, okay. <laughs> when they got to the land. So as soon as they got to the land, seven years. Seven years. Seven years. Yeah. That's right. And you would have been compensated based on the fact that you were only going to be that servant for three years. Okay, so they, they took, they were supposed to take that into consideration. So everything goes, you, it's like you get a do-over. Don't we, we, you know, we, don't you want a do-over? <laughs> they all, they, everybody got a do-over. So yes. It's for one year, and, but, okay, so the Sabbath year, it's fallow. Then the Jubilee year's declared, so now the land's fallow. 
So then in the 51st year, there's still no crop. You have to plant the seed and trust God that it's going to grow. Okay? Does that make sense? So technically, you're, you're really trusting him for... And he says that he will make sure that he's going to provide food for three years. All right? Right, right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Did you have something, Don? Yeah. Huh. Somewhere, huh? Yeah. See, they, but they couldn't own land because God owned it. And he was dividing it up and he was giving it to them to use. Now, we don't know that they ever, ever, ever celebrated a Jubilee year. Why don't we know that? Well, turn with me. Glad you asked. <laughs> you, you are my best plant ever. Okay, go to 2 Chronicles. And it's a couple places in the scriptures, but I'm going to take you to 2 Chronicles. <clears throat> and the reason we know this is because, I, get, uh, I think it's 36, but let me, let me get there. Yeah, uh, 36. Uh, let me, I'm looking at my, my note. Where's my phone? I have a note, my note. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chronicles 36, and let's look at uh, 2 Chronicles 36. And I'm going to just start reading. Um, hmm. Let's see. Um, all right. This this is this is the um, uh, he's talking about Zedekiah. Zedekiah rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar. And um, now uh, all you know what's breaking loose. And you know if, Zed if Zedekiah would have done what God told him to do, they would not have raised uh, Jerusalem. But he didn't. And no, 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 I haven't. T I, I, I'm just in 36, and I'm, I'm looking down, and I'm, gonna, I'm trying to figure out where I want to start. I guess, I guess look, let's look at seven, start at 17. Okay, therefore, God, he brought up against them, Israel, the king of the Chaldeans, and we know him as Nebuchadnezzar, okay, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on young man our virgin, old man, or infirm. He, God, gave them into his hand. All the articles of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king, and his officers, Nebuchadnezzar, he brought them all to Babylon. Then they burned the house and broke down the wall of Jerusalem and burned its fortified buildings with fire, and destroyed all the valuable articles. And those who had escaped from the sword, he carried away to Babylon. And they were servants to him, that's Nebuchadnezzar, and to his sons, until the rule of the kingdom of Persia. Why? Now look at 21. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land did what? Enjoyed its Sabbaths. All the days of its desolation, it kept Sabbath until 70 years were complete. So they had skipped the Sabbath rest, the Jubilee year. And they paid for it. That's how, why God kept them in Babylon for 70 years. And if you want to jot down Jeremiah 25, 11, because Jeremiah writes it down. Daniel reads Jeremiah and knows, uh-oh, it's about the end of the 70 years. All right, but 
So they, they were in captivity 70 years. They were out of the land because they disobeyed God. They were out of the land because they broke the covenant at Mount Sinai. All right. And they were out of the land. God still owned the land. He promised it as an eternal possession. It just meant they couldn't live in it. Why? Because they weren't obeying him and they didn't keep the jubilee year. And so he made sure his land got a rest. Yeah, but they, they had never kept it. That's the point. They were being punished for 70 Sabbath, Jubilee year Sabbaths that they never celebrated. They, they never had enough faith. Does that make sense? They never did this. As far as we know, they never, ever celebrated the Jubilee year. What? Uh, they, they missed 70 of these. Yeah. They missed 70. If you calculate it out, don't ask me to do the math. But they, they, they never, they had 70, every 50 years they were to do this. So there were 70 of those, five times seven. There were, how many years? Yeah, that they didn't do it. They didn't. They were, well, did, God didn't say you don't have to do it if you're at war. But they never trusted God enough to celebrate the Jubilee. As far there's no indication if you go through First Kings, Second Kings, Chronicles, there's no indication they ever celebrated the Jubilee year. Mm -hmm. they, they well no. No, they weren't doing what they were supposed to do. Now, in Jeremiah, there, there's a time where they do set the slaves free, and then they renege. So, this, you know, yeah. They were told to, but they, mm -mm. yeah. They did every year. They did that six years, one year off. I think they did some years. I don't know that they even did all of those. Yeah. God said that they were going to be in captivity, and it was 70 years because they didn't let the land rest. Okay. All right. So. Yeah, not because they want. Okay. Every every seven years, she's reading. Um, Second Chronicles, it says, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah the prophet. Let's look at Jeremiah 25. Just for, for, yeah. No, they couldn't. They were forced, they were forced to give the land the rest that they refused in disobedience to give. All right. Uh, 25, what, 11? Is it 11? Okay, let's see. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Okay. The whole land shall be a desolation. This is before it happens. This is Jeremiah. The whole, this is uh, 25, 11. The whole land will be a desolation and a horror, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then it will be when the 70 years are completed, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, declares the Lord. All right, so it says that they are going to be in captivity for 70 years. Here in 21, it's, it's indicating that it's enjoying the 70 Sabbaths of the Jubilee year that they didn't celebrate. No, because they were disobedient. If they're seven, if they had seven, every seven years they were, to, every 50 years, 50 years, and there were 70 of them. So zero, seven times five, seven times five is um, 35. Okay. So there were 350 
times they didn't celebrate the Jubilee. They didn't do it. Right? Is that, did I do the math right? Okay. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't, uh, I know they have a, I know they have a Sabbath rest for the land, because I've gotten emails about, but I don't know about if they've ever celebrated this, this, yeah. So are we together now? Huh? And they're at war But they're disobedient, too, and they're not. Under a theocracy, and there's a whole lot of other stuff. But under the theocracy, they were supposed to let this land rest, and they didn't do it. And God made sure it rested all the time that they missed while they were in captivity. Are we? Too, does that make sense now? No? Mm -hmm. Okay. We can talk about it some more. Okay. So, but can you think about how much faith it would take? To do that? I mean, and, and just think all the people around you are saying, well, boy, you guys are dumb. How do you know your God's going to come through for you? Other times. Mm -hmm. I know. But see, they didn't have the indwelling Holy Spirit. And the majority of them never circumcised their heart. They never, never surrendered to God. You see a few, Caleb, Joshua, Ruth, Boaz. I'm sure there were more. God always has a remnant. How, how could you, after going through the Red Sea, seeing those, all the, get out in the desert and then say, I want to go back because I miss onions <laughs> and garlic. <laughs> dead is dead, that's right. Dead, dead, dead. Okay. Oh, good. Yes, God is the provider. He wanted to train them to rely on him. He not only provides for our physical needs, he was going to, so he's provided for their spiritual needs. Now, and this didn't happen just out of the blue. This happens on the heels of Day of Atonement. So if they were celebrating Day of Atonement, they would have been celebrating with fasting and repentance. Now, we didn't look at Day of Atonement, but... Do you want to look at Day of Atonement? Sure. sure. All right. Sure, if you have. Well, if everybody knows about Day of Atonement. No? Okay. Now, this was happening, and it's interesting. God has this day of Jubilee, this year of Jubilee. It happens in the fall, the fall festival. Day of Atonement... You're probably familiar with Yom Kippur. Okay. It's celebrated every year. That's the beginning of the calendar year. All right. And it's after all the harvesting's over. All right. So the people will be going back to their land. Okay. To get re at, and, and wouldn't have to harvest. The, the la landowners didn't need them anymore. Because there wasn't going to be a harvest for a few years. She didn't have to go out and work in the field. So it's perfect timing. So the first thing, fasting and repentance. And then you're supposed to have a jubilee, a celebration. But they never did it. So Day of Atonement. The only day of the year when the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. Only day. All what I'm going to tell you that he did He's the only one in the, in the tabernacle. He's the only one there. 
No one's, no one else there. He's the one, there's only one, and he's making the atonement for the people. Now, it's different than, than Jesus because he has to first make atonement for himself. So he takes a bull, he has the, the, the priest, he gets a bull and a ram for he and his family. They get two goats for Israel. He goes in to the temple area, it would be, or the tabernacle, okay, so there's one way in, I'm just rudimentary here, um, the, this is the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant is, where God would meet with the people, right here, okay, then you have the lampstand, you have the table of showbread, you have this altar of incense, Okay, then um, out here you have a laver and you have the burnt, where you made the burnt offerings, all right? There's only one way in, it faced east. So the, the high priest, you know, and he had that fancy garments, right? He took them off. Where he took them off? Oh, that was a big discussion. Where did he take those off? He had to be modest. He must be. No, he would, but he'd take off those garments. He was by himself, that's right. So he'd take off the fancy garments and he would put on just a plain linen uh, ephod and, a, and linen breeches. He would wash here, he'd get himself clean. He would take, first thing that he would take the, um, let's see, make sure, um, the bull and the ram, um, let's see. He would slaughter the bull first, so the bull would, would, go, would be slaughtered out here. I know, bulls are big. He doesn't drag the whole bull in there, but he catches the, the blood in a basin. He goes into the holy place, all right? He takes some coals off of the altar of incense, and he puts them in a censer, and he kind of sneaks them in here so that the whole Holy of Holies is filling up with incense and smoke. Because this is where God dwells. You can't be going in there just willy-nilly. So he takes the blood of the, the uh, bull that's for his sin. He takes it in and then he sprinkles it. I need a blood. I'm going to use the screen thing because that's all I got. Okay, he sprinkled the, the blood on the, the uh, mercy seat and inside the Ark of the Covenant you had the law, you had Aaron's rod that buds and a jar of manna, okay? And so um, he would go in, he'd sprinkle the blood. This is where you, you hear about them tying a rope around his ankle, okay, with bells because if he went in with sin in his life, dead. And they, there's no way to get him. They'd have to haul him out with a rope. Okay. All right. So he, um, and he, there's a, they spread it, the, you know, throw seven times this way and seven times this way. Then uh, he would go out and he would present the two goats. And he, one of the goats, they cast lots. One of the goats was for the Lord. The other goat, they would tie a red string around. All right. He would take the goat for the Lord. And he'd slit its throat, get the blood, and he would go back in, and he would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. So now he's, he's made the sin offering for a whole year. Their sins have been covered all right, in here. Then he, um, you know, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And it's blood that, uh, from the sacrifices that cleanses things. So he puts blood on the horns of the altar to, to cleanse the altar. All right. Now, then, next thing he does is he, after he's gone and done that, he goes in and he t they take this, the second goat and they take that goat and they set him free. They confess sins. That's the scapegoat. He carries 
the sin's off. So you've got a goat that, that's slaughtered, that the blood covers sin, and then this goat symbolizes those sins are taken as far as east is from the west. They're, they're moved out. All right? So then he goes back, he changes his clothes. He takes the ram and offers a burnt offering. Remember, you, can't, you have to cover your sin, you have to deal with your sin before you can consecrate yourself. And so a burnt offering would be a, uh, an offering of, of consecration. So all this is happening right before they were to declare the Jubilee year. Now, the whole idea of looking at all this stuff is can you see how God the great evangelist is setting up I get when you go, oh, oh, ceremonies and activities to prepare the people for what their Messiah was going to do. Their Messiah was to redeem them from slavery, but not a slavery in Egypt, a slavery to, like we learned in Romans, right? In Romans 6, where we're slaves to sin, all right? And that he was the only one redeeming. And what was it going to take? Yeah, it takes obedience, it takes the death of a spotless lamb, right? And to cover, well, it, Jesus' blood does not cover sin. We're going to see it. He takes sin away, all right? And Jesus, being perfect, didn't have to offer a sin offering like the high priest did over here. And look here, Sabbath rest, what do you have? We quit striving to get right with God. Right? We rest in God's provision. We rest knowing that we're going to have a relationship with the living God for all eternity. Right? It's a jubilee. Sins are, all our debts are gone. We're set free from slavery. Well, the land, we'll, we're going to look at that a little bit more. But it's a picture of what Jesus does. So all of these things was preparing them to understand what God was eventually going to do. But they weren't... Right. Oh, bingo. That fits here. Oh, that fits here. That's what I'm hoping is happening as we're talking about all this. Yeah. What, what Jesus takes our sins. What? As far as the east is from the west. Right? It's his blood that covers our breaking of the law and is between us and God. Right? Yeah. So, anyway, and, and so on we go. Huh? Good job. Good. <laughs> oh, good job, God. I mean, it's so, I just think it's so cool how he, he has all these pictures. So, on that day of atonement, uh -huh. um, in that Jubilee, it was, I know dead is used like every year. Right. right. Jubilee, they just didn't do Jubilee. No, apparently not. And then the ju yeah right yeah should they should have celebrated Day of Atonement and then the year of Jubilee started. Well and and, and yeah just like um, pal yeah because I don't know how it works, but you've got the sacred calendar, which is where Passover is, and then you've got the year of Jubilee would it starts with the um, the civil calendar. Because the first of the year, because I was like, first of the year, wait a minute. April's the first of the year, September's the first of the year. Yeah, so. And so looking at all these things, what I, what I want you to see is to pr prepare you to look at our Savior, our Redeemer now. And see this week how he fits all these, all these different things. Um, ceremonies, rituals. Now, um, we did a little cross-referencing to answer a few important questions, like what happens if a man doesn't have any sons? What happens to the land? So in Numbers 27, 8 through 11, what did you learn about what happens to the land?
Did God care? Yes, he did. So if there were no, no, no sons, it goes to the daughters. All right. But there's a problem. The daughter could marry, if, if you're in the tribe of Judah, he, she could marry a, a, a guy in the tribe of Naphtali or Gad. So how's that going to work? Because in the year of Jubilee, the land would not go back to the original tribe. So, right, she, yeah, so if there's no sons, it goes to the daughters, and they can marry whoever they want within the tribe. But they have to marry in the tribe. Now, we looked at, um, in, in Numbers 27, 8 through 11, let, let's just look at that one real fast. It says, uh, speak to the sons of Israel. And it says, if a man dies, and let's say Elimelech. All right, Elimelech died and he had no son. Well, he had sons, but they're dead. Where does the inheritance go? But he didn't have a daughter. Then it goes to the brothers. Well, when they got back to Jerusalem, did he have any brothers? The father's brothers, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, we don't know. His father's brothers are gone. So then where does it go? Oh, so who was Boaz? The nearest relative. Okay. So I just, I just. That's right. But he refused. He refused. He refused. Yes, he did. Yeah, he cared about every detail. And who owns the land? God owns the land, and he's given it to each tribe, and it has to stay within the tribe. You know, we, we don't, I don't think we really understand the importance of that land. Yes, it was. Yep, you had nothing. That's right. It is still his land. Yeah, and who did he give it to for an everlasting possession? Israel. Okay, he gave it to them. But they get to live on it when they're obeying. If they're disobeying, they reap the curses of the Sinai covenant and they moved out of the land. And it's only been since, what, 1948 that they've been trickling back in to that land. But there's still a lot of fussing over who owns that land. And God will work it out. And he will give them that land. Pardon me? Every foot of that land he's going to, he will give it to them. When, when, when uh, he, he works. Now, um, we looked at Joshua 18 and, and some of the dividing up of the land. Um, just a little aside, and then we'll break up into our small groups. But there were 12 tribes, correct? All right. The Levites did not receive any land. Okay. Their, their um, portion was who? Was God. Okay. So how do we get to 12? The two, pardon, the two tribes of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. All right, the half, well, they, they call them the half tribes because they're half of Joseph's inheritance, okay? All right, so I just wanna make sure that, because you know, I used to look for the tribe of Joseph, I'm like, well, where are those guys? Joseph was a good guy. Well, he's, he's really not mentioned. Yeah, he gets a double portion, and it goes to his, his two sons. Twelve. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah. And then Simeon, did you know Simeon ends up in the middle of Judah? His tribe was shrinking. His tribe was shrinking. But I, 
I think it was because of his disobedience. I'm sorry, but that's what comes to my mind. Yeah, but um, Simeon and uh, J -j 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 Levi were the two that... Uh, with uh, yeah, that they pun punish Shechem by saying, "Okay, you guys can all enter in the covenant, just get circumcised." And then when they were hurting, he execu they executed them all. Not a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. And Reuben, he was firstborn, but he lost his privilege because he slept with his father's concubine. So, and there we have it. Those those. <laughs> Only if you're a daughter oh, with okay. land. Okay. 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 Yeah, no, if you fell in love with a, with a Gadite and you were from, yeah, you could, you know, and you're, yeah. Hopefully there was a little mixing up because it might get a little, um, yeah. But if you were in a, an inheritor of land, that land had to stay in the tribe. Right. Okay. All right, clear as mud? Okay, all right. What I want you to focus on, though, because God is always, always, always the focus of any Old Testament story or event, and I want you to see how brilliant he is. Oh, how can he, he comes up with the many, now look, look with me at Hebrews chapter one that, for, and, and verse one, because this, this is what we're, we're looking at. Hebrews 1, <clears throat> and it says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets, Moses is a prophet, right? So in many portions, so in many parts, here a little, there a little, uh, you know, in, in the redemption of the firstborn and Passover and Sabbath rests in the law, in, in the different festivals, and in many ways, visions, parables, types, psalms, etc., etc., etc. In these last days, he has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the world. So all these things are to help us know and remember the one that spe he's speaking to us now. Okay? So you don't have to go back and celebrate this stuff. He's fulfilled it. There, I think there's a movement. Lots of people want to go back and you've been set free. Nope. Well, like even with Day of Atonement, once the once Jerusalem was sacked again and the temple was destroyed, there's no more sacrifices. Why? Jesus, he's our sacrifice. He's our sacrifice. We don't need any sacrifice. Right? They don't. They do mitzvahs, good works. And then there's a group in Africa, I think, that sacrificed chickens. No. Now, how that worked out, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Chickens? <laughs> That's, oh, there you go. <laughs> That's why there's an egg shortage. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how they came up with that. But, but it just goes to show you, you know, even the genealogy lists are gone. You know, if you ask a Jewish person, do you know what tribe you're from? Mm -mm. They've been trying to find those of, in the Levite um, family, tribe, because they're the priests. And they're, they, they're prepared. They're ready to rebuild that temple. And so they look for last name of Cohen. So the rabbis don't even know the lineage? Mm -mm. No. You don't have to be of a lineage for a rabbi. Yeah. The high priest, the priest came from the Levites. Mm -hmm. Cohen means, I think Cohen means priest in Latin, or no, in something. And so the last name of Cohen, they're, they're looking, they look into the, 
genealogy of Cohen's trying to find, they're trying to find some legitimate priests. So, anyway. Yeah, he better go in with a rope on, and he better not have sacrificed a chicken either. That's all I got. That's all. That's my advice. All right, let me pray, and we'll go talk a little bit more in our small groups. You guys did a great job. Keep pressing on. Um, we'll tie it all together with uh, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, next week. Okay, so hopefully we have the foundation of what what. Helps us understand what the Jews knew a little bit more. But you know, without the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't understand either. Right? Right. Okay. Lord, thank you for all that you've shown us this morning. Thank you for how you've just built out truth. I thank you that you are a God who wants us to know the way of salvation, that you are a Redeemer God, that there's no Savior but you. And that you were so willing to send your son to die on a cross in our behalf, who was perfect and yet took the penalty for us so that we might be set free like in the year of Jubilee and our debts would be paid like in the year of Jubilee. Oh, Lord, thank you. You are a great God, a great Savior, a great Redeemer. And Father, I just ask that you would help us fuel the flames of our heart that we just want to know you and love you and grow to know you more and more and that in doing that we would become a little bit more like your son Jesus and it's in his name that we pray these things. Amen.